Welcome to Ancient World Studies. My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin. The question is, who was the son of Caesar and Cleopatra? Greek sailors from the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt discovered the sea route to India in about 118 BC. In the following decades, they began using the powerful monsoon winds to sail from the Red Sea ports to India on voyages that crossed more than 3,000 miles and required up to 10 weeks to accomplish. The development of these commercial networks provided Queen Cleopatra with a possible escape route that would take her royal court far from the threat of her Roman enemies. The last Ptolemaic queen, Cleopatra VII, was in a relationship with the Roman dictator Julius Caesar. In 47 BC, she bore Caesar a son named Caesarion, who they expected to succeed to the throne of Egypt and follow his father into Roman politics. The name Caesarion was a Latin nickname meaning Little Caesar, and the boy was known in Egypt by the grand title of Ptolemy Caesar. During his short life, he was acknowledged as Ptolemy XV and held the dual titles, King and Pharaoh. According to Roman accounts, Caesarion bore a close resemblance to his father, which increased as he grew. Suetonius records, Finally, Caesar called Cleopatra to Rome and did not let her leave until he had awarded her high honours and rich gifts. He also allowed her to give his name to the child which she bore. In fact, according to certain Greek writers, this child was very like Caesar in looks and mannerisms. Suetonius, Life of Julius Caesar In this period, Cyprus was a possession of the Ptolemaic kingdom, and to reinforce this claim, Cleopatra had coins minted on this Greek island, depicting herself holding her infant son Caesarion. Meanwhile in Rome, Caesar arranged the construction of a new temple dedicated to his patron deity, Venus Denetrix, Venus, founder of the family. It is reported that he placed a figure of Queen Cleopatra next to the main cult statue of the goddess he had displayed in the inner sanctum. Appian reports. Julius Caesar erected the temple to Venus, his ancestral founder, as he had vowed to do when he was about to begin the Battle of Thessalus. He laid out ground around the temple, which he planned to be a forum for the Roman people, not for buying and selling, but a meeting place for the transaction of public business. It was to function like the public squares of the Persians, where the people assembled to seek justice or to learn the laws. He placed a beautiful image of Cleopatra by the side of the goddess, which stands there to this day. Appian Histories Cleopatra seemed to encourage her association with this divinity by dressing as the Egyptian goddess Isis, who the Greeks and Romans associated with Aphrodite and Venus. A wall painting from the Roman city of Pompeii appears to depict Cleopatra as a maternal aspect of the goddess Venus. This is one of the few images of the Greco-Egyptian queen to have survived from antiquity, except for a possible marble head excavated in an Italian villa near Rome. Apart from these objects, the appearance of the queen is suggested by tiny portraits displayed on Ptolemaic coins and royal seals. The painting of Cleopatra as Venus was in a room that was walled up and abandoned in about 31 BC. This occurred soon after Octavian and the Senate declared Cleopatra an enemy of the Roman state. The owner of the house, Marcus Fabius Rufus, probably considered the painting a subversive image, but as it still held associations with the goddess, it could not be defaced and was concealed instead. The cupid next to the goddess could be a representation of the infant Caesarion, the child who would unite the authority of Rome with the royal divinity of the Ptolemaic kings. Despite this symbolic recognition for Cleopatra, Caesar did not mention his son Caesarion in his revised will, which he redrafted on his return from Spain in 45 BC. Nevertheless, in 44 BC, Cleopatra travelled again from Alexandria to Rome with the three-year-old infant. By this period, Caesar was the supreme leader of the Roman Republic, and Cleopatra wanted his support to confirm 
the independent status of Ptolemaic Egypt. She was therefore present in the city when Caesar was assassinated, but she failed to have her infant son recognised as his official heir. Cleopatra was considered a divine monarch in her Egyptian homeland and could therefore change Ptolemaic law and succession claims to suit her precise purpose and wishes. But in Roman law, marriage with foreign non-citizens did not have legitimacy, and children from these unions had no automatic Latin legal rights. Consequently, Caesar's existing will was followed, and his grandnephew Octavian, a full Roman citizen, was proclaimed the primary heir to his property and familial contacts. Octavian was scarcely twenty years old, but he acted decisively to assert his legal authority and claim his place in leading Roman politics. But he had to institute new legal measures, Alex Curiata, to validate his status as a posthumously adopted son of Caesar. Having failed to achieve her aims, Cleopatra left Rome a few weeks after the murder of Caesar and returned unopposed to Egypt. There she had the infant Caesarion proclaimed as her co-regent, Ptolemy the Fifteenth Caesarion. He also received the traditional Greek royal titles, Philometor and Philopater, to signal his expected loyalty and devotion to both his mother and father. The native Egyptians, who maintained their own royal traditions, had the new Ptolemaic king immediately depicted in stylized form as a full adult pharaoh. Examples include the wall relief at the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. In reality, the infant may have appeared in public dressed in a miniature form of the traditional Greco-Macedonian royal garb. This was a purple and gold Hematian robe, with a royal diadem resembling an ornamental headband. The Egyptian depictions of Caesarion as an adult king was because this culture traditionally demanded rule by a male pharaoh. But despite this symbolism, the boy Caesarion was only a nominal king, and Cleopatra ensured that only her royal portrait appeared on Ptolemaic coins. The Egyptian temple at Hermonthus also had a nativity shrine added to honour Caesarion. This Mamissai, or birth shrine, depicted Caesarion in the form of a young Horus. This was significant as Horus was the Egyptian god of kingship, who, with the assistance of the goddess Isis, avenged his murder father, Osiris. Cleopatra also ordered the construction of a colossal temple to the dead Julius Caesar to be constructed in the capital, Alexandria. This strengthened the prospect that the young Caesarian might one day obtain a high position in the government of the Roman Republic. In 41 BC, Cleopatra began a relationship with another leading Roman commander named Mark Antony. Antony was in his 40s, and having served in numerous previous commands, he was the most senior political figure in the Roman government to emerge after the death of Caesar. In particular, he had the authority to manage and control the eastern client rulers who were subject to, or directed by, Rome. Antony was prepared to recognise Caesarion as the legitimate son of Julius Caesar, and tried to persuade other influential Romans to accept this claim. In contrast, Octavian and his supporters refuted the claim as it undermined his own authority as the prime successor to Caesar. Suetonius reports. Mark Antony declared to the Senate that Caesar had actually acknowledged the boy Caesarion as his own, and that Gaius Matius, Gaius Opius, and other friends of Caesar knew this to be true. Of these witnesses, Gaius Opius as if admitting that the situation required apology and defence, published a pamphlet. This sought to prove that the child whom Cleopatra claimed was Caesar's was not actually his son. Suetonius. But there were further threats to the authority of Octavian. While they were together, Cleopatra bore Antony three children who combined the status of Ptolemaic royalty with the prestige and connections of a high-profile Roman political family. The twins, Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene, were born in about 41 BC. In 37 BC, 
Antony rejoined Cleopatra in Alexandria, and in 36 BC, the queen bore him another child known as Ptolemy Philadelphus. Despite their royal lineage and grand titles, the children had no inheritance rights or citizen status in Roman law. Nevertheless, Mark Antony used the authority of his imperial commands to have these children recognised as current and future rulers of eastern territories, either those already held by Rome or expected to soon be conquered. In this grand ceremony, known as the Donations of Alexandria, Antony formally affirmed a Caesarian to be the son of Caesar. The boy also received the title, King of Kings, which was proclaimed by the rulers of the Parthian Empire in ancient Persia. Diocasius reports. Antony declared that Cleopatra was the wife of Julius Caesar, and Caesarian was Caesar's son. He therefore claimed to be enacting these measures for the sake of Caesar. But his real purpose was to reproach Octavian, because he was only an adopted son, and not a real son of Caesar. Dio Cassius, Histories Antony was joined in Alexandria by his young son Antillus, who had been born to his previous wife Fulvia. The name Antillus was probably a nickname given to the boy by his father and signified the archer. Unlike his half-siblings, Marcus Antonius Antillus possessed full Roman citizen status and was Antony's designated heir according to Roman law. Antony therefore depicted a portrait of himself and his son on some of the coins he issued in the eastern territories subject to his command. Antillus was about the same age as Caesarian, and would have been almost twelve when the donations of Alexandria were proclaimed by Antony and Cleopatra. Meanwhile, in Rome, Octavian was disturbed by these far-reaching political developments. He therefore escalated the rhetoric against Cleopatra, unprepared for civil war against Mark Antony. Dio Cassius reports. Octavian reproached Antony for having Cleopatra's children acknowledged as his own and bestowing upon them eastern territories. In particular, Antony was proclaiming Caesarian and inducting him into the family of Julius Caesar. Octavian and Antony made these charges against one another to justify their conduct. Octavian communicated his concerns by private letters and public speeches. Antony made his interests known through public proclamations. Dio Cassius, Histories The accusations culminated in a public display in Rome, where Octavian opened and read out the private sealed will of Mark Antony, this provided proof of Antony's long-term plans for the eastern half of the Roman Empire, where he might replace imperial commands with autocratic royal rule. Dio Cassius reports, Octavian read Antony's will to the Senate and later to the Assembly. This procedure was unlawful, but the contents of the documents were such that Octavian received no reproach from the citizens, for Antony had attested that Caesarian was the actual son of Caesar and he had given enormous rewards to the children that he was raising with that Egyptian queen. Antony also instructed that following his death, his body should be buried in Alexandria by her side. Dio Cassius, Histories. This was a justification for war, to preserve the future of the Roman Republic. Please see part three of this video lecture concerning Cleopatra and Caesarian's planned escape to India. Please follow the link below to access primary sources at my Academia website. Like and share this video lecture. Follow this channel. Thank you.